Okay, uh, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us again on this Tuesday for our F1 session. So it'll be given by Dr. Kanch, and it's just about how to do how to be a surgical F1 and what kind of stuff you're going to run into. So as always, if you have any questions or comments, if you're on the Zoom, put them in the chat box, or put them in the Q and A box, and if you're watching on our Facebook, feel free to comment anything, and Kanch will get to them when she can. Otherwise, I'll hand it over to you. Sweet. Um, so do you want me to wait for a bit, or are you okay for me to continue, just start? Um, yeah, I would just do like a little like phase, like introduction by myself and then just start. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so um, I started my, hi, I'm Kansh, I'm an F2 currently in psychiatry in East Kent. Um, I'm going to have to do uh, CST next year. Um, I started my F1 in, um, in a, on, on Gen Surge job, and I was a little bit kind of nervous going in. Um, so I'm just going to go through a little bit about... Um, kind of what the job involved, kind of the common things that we, we saw on the wards. And at the end, end on a kind of, and then a little bit about what, what, what was helpful for me as an F1. Um, if you have any questions at all, um, yeah, please stop me um, or please uh, kind of put it on the chat. Um, I'll stick around afterwards if you have any questions as well. Yeah, so um, this is a disclaimer that they asked me to put up. Um, it's just, this is not medical advice, it's just a tutorial. So this is a bit of an overview of the session. So um, I'll start by doing a bit of an overview of the job, what it involves, kind of the day to day. Then we'll go through kind of three common cases that you're likely to see on the wards um, and kind of go through, have a think about how you'd manage that sort of thing. Um, and then I'll end on a couple of tips. Um, yeah, so your day-to-day -day job. So your day job kind of has kind of a couple of things that, a couple of big things that you can get involved in. Um, ward rounds, which you'll start your day with a ward round. You'll start fairly early, actually. Um, you move on to your ward jobs. You'll be called fairly, kind of fairly often to deal with deteriorating patients, post-op complications, that sort of thing. And this was the bit that really excited me. Every once in a while, they'll be short of hands of theatres and they'll get one of you to go in. And it's, for me at least, it was really good fun. Really, really, it's, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed the time in theatres. Um, I think the thing about the surgical jobs is if you're even a little bit keen and you're re even a little bit interested, they're really, really lovely about getting you involved. So, you know, if you, you know, if you want a project, you want to get involved at audits, this is a really good place to do it because there's always so much happening. Yeah, so ward rounds. So ward rounds are quick and they're early. So get a cup of coffee before you go in. Um, you'll be seeing quite a lot of patients. We tended to see 20 or 30 patients on our ward rounds. Um, and they generally took about, you know, kind of one or two hours and we blitzed through everyone. Um, that's, I mean, it's not a bad thing. They're very, they're generally, surgical ward rounds are generally very efficient. They're very kind of focused things. But a couple of things that help make them more, run more smoothly are kind of prepping your ward rounds. So, um, so we used to go in a little bit early, so kind of 15 minutes early and just run through kind of, and just, just add the headings onto things, add kind of little bits like the news scores and any kind of obviously kind of, obviously off blood results onto the, onto the notes. We didn't manage to do it every day, but on days we did, it kind of life was just a little bit easier on the round. Um, I, again, like if you're um, if you're having if if you're in a trust that has written notes, you get very good at writing very quickly. But also prepping ward rounds would be very helpful if you have written notes. Um, it's uh, we we had typed notes, so it was actually kind of less of an issue, um, but it was still helpful to do. Um, so you've got a question, I think. Oh no. Um, sorry. So, uh, so a couple of things to, that, that are helpful to do on your ward round are scans. So clarify the indications for scans. Um, a lot of the time you'll go past, you go through quite a lot of patients and you will get asked to request, you know, five or six scans on a ward round. Make sure that you are clear on why you're ordering these scans, because the thing is, a lot of the time your registrar will get called off the theaters and they won't be on the ward with you. Um, so, so then having to request a scan and then, you know, on your second week, having to talk, call the radiology registrar and tell them why you want the scan that you're not entirely sure why you want, um, is just, just makes your life harder. So, so make sure you know why you're requesting things like scans, request, why you're requesting specific tests. Um, that drains. So lots of particular general surgery ward, lots of patients will come up from theater center with drains. And this is the kind of thing that nurses will ask you quite a lot, will frequently ask you about. Um, as a rule of thumb, they generally you generally take down a drain after it's stopped after it's draining less than thirty mils over twenty four hours. But do clarify that with your kind of reg or your consultant or whoever is doing the ward round. And then follow up. So a lot of the time, um, so make sure you know what's going to happen to patients once they leave, because 
again, uh, make sure you, you don't want them to be lost to kind of follow up. You don't want them to kind of go off and not hear back from you. Um, a couple of things, you will, there will be kind of certain job specific things. So at an F1, I worked kind of um, an upper GI ward and an ortho Jerry's ward. So with orthopedics, things like weight bearing status are really, really helpful to clarify during a ward round because that has an impact on what kind of physio they can do, what kind of rehab they can do. Things like on, on upper GI, so our ward had lots of esophage, post esophagectomy patients. Um, and it was kind of the, the kind of feeds that they were allowed to have that was really helpful to clarify. So whether they could have kind of clear fluids or water and tea, or they could have a mashed diet. Those are sort of things that impact on their day massively. So it's worth kind of making sure that you know about. So I think I have a question. Um, someone says, okay, so somebody asked if you get taught procedures during F1 or you expect to know. Um, so you're, yes, you, so you're, I mean, you're kind of expected to be able to take bloods and cannulas, but having said that, seniors are really, really, so check with your F2, your SHO, just other F1s are always really, really supportive. So generally what we did if, was, what we tended to do is um, if someone was having trouble getting bloods or having trouble doing cannulas or even hadn't done them before, one of the other, we'd start with the other F1s. So one of us would go with them and kind of do the first round, first couple of bloods. Uh, and then they'd build up confidence that way. So it's not the end of the world if you haven't done lots of procedure, lots of kind of practical stuff before beforehand. Um, there's always someone to lend a hand. Also nurses, nurses are really lovely about teaching you procedures. Um, do you have to book follow-up appointments for yourself before discharging a patient? Yeah, so, um, so it depends. Different hospitals have different procedures. At St. Thomas's, we had to put it, it was just an online form that you put in for every patient to book a follow-up. Um, a lot of hospitals, you just, you'd specify it in on, on discharge summary and the cl ward clerks would book it in. Um, are you expected to insert drains? No, 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 no. So drains get inserted in intraoperatively. So they'll come back from theaters with a the drain in situ. Um, we sometimes got asked to help take out drains, um, but that, that's the kind of thing you, you, you'd have a senior show you how to do if at all you were, um, you, if you were being asked to do it. Um, also, I've got another one that says, how involved are you in surgeries as an F1? Do you get to suture and actually participate or do you just hold stuff? Um, so you start out just holding stuff, but the better they get to know you and the more they get to know about how much you can, you can do, the more they'll give, let you do. So if you're a little bit, if you're keen and you turn up to theaters, well, I tended to go in on my days off actually. Um, so I was incredibly keen, but, but it meant that I got to do a little bit more. I got to do kind of a bit more suturing. I got to kind of close different layers. So it's really kind of, you, you get out what you put into if it's surgery, I think. Um, so, you know, turn up, be there, you know, turn up to theaters, turn up to lists on, you know, time that maybe you would have had free and people will really, are really lovely about letting you get involved. So, um, ward jobs. Okay. So, um, so, so then, so you'll, you'll do your two hour kind of ward round and then you've kind of, a lot of the time it's you and a couple of other F1s sorting things out in the ward because a lot of the time your SHO will be in, or it, my experience of this was my SHO was generally in A&E clocking patients and my registrar was generally, quite a lot of the time my registrar would be in theatres. Um, so the kind of the big thing, um, so, and, and a lot of time it's kind of easy to feel like the gold daddy here where you kind of, don't quite know what you're doing and you hope you're being helpful, but you may not be, feel like you're being helpful. Um, but, but a lot of the time you're doing those jobs that are really, really important that really need to get done. And I kind of think of kind of the surgical F1 as the spleen. So it's kind of like a, quite underappreciated. No one really knows what they do, but they're really important to the getting things moving. Um, so the one, the big thing that I think is very helpful um, is to learn to make a good, sol a good list. So you do your ward round, you come to the office and make a jobs list put down everything that needs to be done for each patient on kind of, I, we tended to make kind of a sort of two, a two column grid on a A4 piece of paper. Um, and then just little squares for whether you've done it or not. After that, you can divvy up the job. So, you know, someone who likes taking bloods can go with the bloods if there are any, or people who, you know, are, would like to, happy to discharge some race, they can go off to do them, but make sure you have a comprehensive list of what needs to be done that day. The other thing about this is you can prioritize, it lets you prioritize things. So work your way from things that need to be done quickly to things that have time. And in that vein, get your scans requested early because a lot of decisions in surgery will depend on the results of the scan. So once you, what we tended to do is we'd finish the ward round. And if we hadn't ordered them during the ward round, we would order the scans straight after the ward round. Because that means during the day between sort of 11 and 5, 11, kind of 3.30 before, you know, someone comes in to check in, the the patients are getting sent for their scans and we're getting the scan reports back. 
because that's quite that's quite important to make sure that decisions are being made kind of reasonably quickly and people stays on being elongated because they haven't had scans. Um, another thing I found quite useful to do was prepping discharge summary. So what we a lot of the time what we would do is if we had a free day we'd or we had a quiet ward we we'd start writing up discharge summaries for people who were going imminently, uh, and this actually made our lives a lot easier. Um, so a lot of your life in F1 could be writing discharge summaries more so on a surgical ward because the turnover of patients is so quick. Um, if you've got a free moment, get them done, get them, get them prepped and ready because the thing is on a day on a day when someone decides they want to discharge three or four patients and you're running around trying to get all the paperwork done, it means you're, the chance of making a mistake kind of just go up just because you're just up a little bit more frazzled. The chance of things getting delayed because when, when, you have to, when you hand in your discharge summary, that needs to go down to pharmacy, the medication needs to come up. It takes time. Um, so what, what, was really, what, what got really easy for us was that we'd have all this stuff prepped and ready. So we could literally add the ward round, sometimes on the ward rounds, and then just after we could print them off, give them to the nurses, and things would just move on a bit more smoothly. Um, got a, I've got a question there that says, how do you prep them as you go along? Oh, so um, I got a question that says, how do you prep what uh, discharge summaries as you go along? So uh, a lot of things were kind of things like, uh, so the discharge summary is a summary of their care, right? So why someone came in, what brought them in, what operation they had, whether there were any kind of complications during the, um, during the operation. Um, so a lot of that stuff you can put in. Also, if there's kind of predictable things to follow up, you can leave that in as well. So if you know kind of everyone who has a, uh, everyone who has a gallbladder operation gets followed up in six weeks, then you can put that in. Or if you know that people generally get sent home on a specific cocktail of, um, of, of analgesia, you can provisionally put that in. What we tended to do is put big kind of caps locks at the top saying draft, do not print until finalized. And then at the end, we'd be able to tweak it and say, okay, actually, you know, take off the bits that weren't relevant and add on bits that were needed. Um, what meds should go on a TTO? So this, this varies. So if you've had a page, so it usually kind of, so generally if the patient's been on your ward for a couple of days or longer, all of their medications go on a TTO. So everything they're taking, including the regular medications. So a lot of the time you'd have a little old lady who's come in on like 15 meds. And then you've added on some antibiotics and maybe some painkillers and they've stayed in for a week. Then you need to do um, a teacher with all of, generally you'd have to do one with all of them in. Uh, occasionally, if you had someone coming into like a day, day, a day assessment unit or kind of an acute ward where they stayed less than 24 hours, you could just kind of prescribe um, what had been prescribed in that visit. So in our assessment unit, we tended to kind of just prescribe the, the painkillers or the antibiotics or what was given that day. Um, it will vary from trust to trust, um, and it would, will vary between teams and between teams what they like to prescribe. Um, but generally, um, if they've stayed longer than a couple of days, you will be doing all of them. You'll have to do all of the medications. Having said that, your TTOs will be checked. Pretty much all your, I'm fairly, most of your TTOs will be checked by a pharmacist, and make friends with your pharmacist. That's another thing that's, that's that was really really helpful in F1 uh, in F1. Make, your, the pharmacists are a brilliant source of information. They, they really know so much um, and they're really, really lovely. So make sure, you know, make friends with them. Um, so you, like, so like I said, um, you will get good at, so you will do lots of, you will get good at procedures, even if you haven't done very many before. Um, like you will get good at the core skills because you will just get asked to do them. Um, what I wanted to do in my first couple of weeks was I'd stay, I, I, if nurses had can, I kind of asked the nurses to kind of find me if they had candles to do just so I could get a bit better at them. Um, but you don't have to, you don't read. I mean, that, that was probably a bit of a, a bit overkill actually. Um, but you will get good at them. Um, again, catheters, you will get called to do quite a lot of. Um, with surgical patients, it's really important to remember VTE prophylaxis because they are quite a lot of the time, they, they might be in for cancer surgery. Um, Post-operatively, there's increased risk of thrombosis. Um, so make sure that, so depending on your, what your, so different consultants have different preferences, but make sure that you've done a VT assessment and you prescribe the appropriate um, kind of uh, low, mole low molecular weight heparin or whatever their regular anticoagulant is and plus or minus TEDs. <coughs> Remember some people get extended prophylaxis. So this is uh, extended prophylaxis essentially after someone's had major surgery. So in our hospital, it was people who'd had cancer surgery or people who had hip replacements would go home with 28 days of doltaparin. <clears throat> and this is to prevent kind of clots post-operatively after they've gone home. Because a lot of the time they're still hypercoagulable. They might be still, um, they might still have decreased motility. Um, so, so you need, so check, 
you do be, be aware that some of your patients might be going home with an extended dose of, um, of anticoagulants and make sure you know which ones are going home with extended dose of anticoagulants. Um, and keep an eye on post pain and analgesia. Uh, I'll come back to this later. <clears throat> so uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of common cases that you'll see on the wards. Um, so case one, uh, so this is the kind of thing that the nurses will come and find you and ask you to come and assess quite commonly. So case one, you're the F1 um, and a nurse comes and says, bed 15 is spiking. They're a 77 year old female. They're day three post um, emergency laparotomy for ischemic bowel. <clears throat> They've had a successful small bowel resection and ileostomy formation. <coughs> and the news is seven. <clears throat> I want you to have a think about, um, I want you to have a quick think for about a minute about what your first thoughts are. What are the things that worry you when you hear these, when you hear this presentation? And think about what you want to do first. And then think about where you can go to get help. Um, so um, any thoughts, put them in the messages. So someone says sepsis, A, B, C, D, E, sepsis six, brilliant. Someone else says infection, absolutely. Uh, I'm just gonna get a glass of water. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> uh, somebody else has said, High news score, check ops, call for help, ABCD, absolutely. This is brilliant. And someone else has said, wind, water, wounded, walking. Absolutely, yeah. This is all really, really sensible. Yeah, so absolutely, ABCD is, is your first point of call. Sepsis is the big thing we're worried about here. Um, so let's have a look at, next slide. <clears throat> yeah. so, so yes, absolutely. Sepsis is kind of the big, the big worry here. We're worried about some sort of infection. They are spiking, which is absolutely kind of the key thing here. Um, and in the post-operative patient, um, yes, I did see the WWW mnemonic as well. So I, I quite like this mnemonic that was on um, Teach Me Surge, the Teach Me Surgery website. There's lots of sources that you can that of infection. So they kind of they kind of range from the the kind of the common the chest infections and the UTIs and the catheters. Um, they these uh, so so these. So these, these could all, um, so these are kind of common things that you'd see on a medical ward as well. So these can all be kind of source of infection, but also things like the cut. So a wound infection or a, collect, uh, or a collection in the abdo abdomen or pelvis. Um, I'm so sorry, I've got a phone call. I'm just gonna, hello? So yeah, so there's a couple of places that you can go for, uh, you, can, you can have infections from. So the cut collections, again, so DVTs could present with pyrexia. Uh, and then potentially lines. So line infections are reasonably common, particularly people who've had long-standing venous access. So Hickman lines can fairly, Hickman lines, pick lines, uh, central lines can sometimes get infected as well. Uh, so think about all these things. Uh, with regards to your chest infection, particularly in abdominal surgery, patients are predisposed to kind of post-operative echolexis. So essentially what, what's happening is they're in quite a lot of pain post-operatively. So they don't take very big breaths, which means they're sort of sits in the lungs. And so which is why you have quite a lot of kind of, um, it's fairly common to see post-operatively people getting a pneumonia. Um, and what are you going to do? Absolutely, someone said sepsis six. So three in and three out. So you want otosat, you want you give them oxygen, give them antibiotics, and give them some fluids if they're hypotensive. And you want cultures, you want a lactate, and you want to measure urine output. This doesn't mean you have to put a catheter into every single person who's spiking spiking temperatures. Quite a lot of the time, you can get away with getting them to kind of chart. Patients are really helpful. Uh, patients will are usually really really sensible about when you when you say we need to chart your urine. They have a lot of the time they're really sensible about making sure it's measured. Um, so not everyone needs a catheter. It's not a kind of a hard and fast rule, but you do want to measure their urine output. Other things you want to do with the bedside, um, like someone said before, absolutely do the observations. Uh, make sure you get other bloods. So the usual stuff, CRPs, usenes, um, electrolyte, usenes, um, your LFTs, uh, a CRP as well, an FBC, all of those need to be done. And who are you going to call? So there's lots of places you can go to for help. So there's people and there's kind of guidelines. 
So actually, first point of call is always going to be on, is you're going to be a nursing team and the other F1s, because those are the people who are going to be on the ward with you. Um, and, and these are the people who see these every day. So your nurse, especially in your first months as an F1, the nurses are, you know, the, the nurses are, will, will save your life so often. Um, because this is the sort of thing they've seen every day. And this is the kind of thing. So I, I remember kind of the first time I got called to um, assess a temperature, I was, you know, I was afraid. Um, and, and kind of the nurses are brilliant when it comes to kind of being, being quite calm about things and kind of um, helping you out, especially they, they are really lovely about helping out new F1s. Um, the other F1s, sometimes it's, it's just having someone to talk to, go, going over differential, to go over differentials with. Um, in our first weeks, we wound up going and seeing people in pairs, actually, because we were kind of so nervous about the whole thing. Um, and then you remember to escalate. So your SHO is always going to be available. Your registrar is around. If not, the consultant is also around. So um, make sure you escalate quickly because um, these things can deteriorate. So a lot of things can be managed reasonably well on the ward. Um, but things like wound infections, things like collect abdominal collections need escalation fairly rapidly. So make sure that make sure that you're telling your reg or your SHO that these things are happening. Um, it may not be that you, you feel like you need them on the ward, but they should be informed. Um, other case, uh, other people you can get help from if kind of, you know, everyone's stuck in theatres and there's absolutely no one around. The medreg, medregs are brilliant. Um, they will, again, uh, they will save your life and probably lots of other lives, um, kind of quite a lot in F1. Um, most hospitals will have kind of a team called a kind of a critical care out outreach team um, or a critical care team, they come, or a critical response team. So there are different names for this team, but essentially it's a group of specialist nurses that work kind of between ITU and the wards, and their job is essentially to scope out the, re the deteriorating patient to flag them up to ITU quite a lot of the time. But they are, again, a brilliant group to go, for, go to for help. Um, so they're, they're really, really helpful, particularly uh, in managing acutely humble patients. Again, your pharmacists, um, so they know the drugs back and front, backward, backwards and forwards and back to front. Um, they're really helpful for kind of uh, antimicrobial guidelines, um, and again, micro microbiology. So if someone's had culture sent off and they're on antibiotics and they're not responding, microbiology are really, really helpful about kind of ta tailoring the antibiotics. Um, other things that are helpful, uh, look at trust guidelines. So antimicrobial guidelines will vary between trusts, as I'm sure you know. Um, so these are really, it, it's really worth looking these up and you will get to know them quite well over the year. Um, look at the BNF. The BNF is really helpful. I would recommend getting the BNF app, actually. Um, I find it, I, I use it every other day, I find. Um, nice guidelines are quite helpful. Um, there's, a lot, there's lots of other kind of quite helpful apps on the ward. So things like in, this app called Induction that tells you who's bleep, who's on what bleep um, in your hospital, and it covers quite a lot of hospitals. I would recommend getting that too. So case two. Um, so I'm just going to see if there's any. I've got one question on the chat, I think. How do you measure the urine output without a catheter? Um, if it's a man, give them a bottle, they'll pee in a bottle. If it's a woman, ask them to pee in. Uh, essentially, the nurses will give them a bowl to pee in or give them a commode and they'll, the nurses will measure, um, measure the kind of volume of urine that they pass. Um, case two. So she's seeing kittens on the ward. So this is your presentation. A nurse comes in, she says, Miss Singh is not right. She says there are kittens sitting on the end of her bed. She's an 83-year-old female. She's day one point post right hem hip hemiarthroplasty for a neck of femur fracture. Her background is type two diabetes and she's got mild vascular dementia. What do you think is happening and what could be causing this? Um, as, um, as before, kind of uh, any suggestions you have, put them, on the, put them on the chat. Yes, someone says delirium, absolutely. Any other thoughts? So somebody says, uh, pain, infection, metabolic, hydration, constipation, up. very impressive, yeah. Electrolyte imbalance, absolutely. Deteriorating vascular dementia, that's, um, we, we can come back to that. So someone said, risk factors, older age, in hospital, underlying dementia, absolutely, brilliant. Someone else said opiates, absolutely. Um, opiates could be called constipating, <laughs> really, really sensible, yeah, absolutely. Pain contributing, yeah, all of this is really, yeah, you, you, um, pain contributing to delirium, absolutely. Um, someone said HHS, um, not quite at this point. You wouldn't quite, give, that wouldn't be the kind of top of your list of referentials, but it's something to consider. 
are there actually kitchens on the bed? Um, this is from Esan who's running this. So no, there are not actually kittens on the bed. Um, hypoglycemia, absolutely, could be. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Um, so yes, absolutely, like you said, absolutely, post-op delirium. So, um, so this is kind of essentially fluctuations in consciousness um, post-operatively. And there's a lot of things that put you at risk of it. And like someone mentioned, it's being older, having multiple comorbidities. So coming, coming in kind of a little bit worse for wear, underlying dementia, un underlying cognitive impairment, even mild cognitive impairment. So you don't have to have, you know, an awful MMSC, um, but you, it, it does predispose you to it. Things like renal impairment, male impairment, uh, male gender, uh, sensory impairment. So again, if you're, um, if, if, if you have, if, if you're deficient in a sense, um, it, it could absolutely predispose you to um, delirium post-op. And there's lots of things, and the, the thing with delirium is there's a lot of things that could cause it, like so many of you said. So hypoxia could cause it, and hypoxia could come in post-operatively. So just kind of as a result of post-operative atelectasis, post-operative pneumonia, just the fact that they're not ventilating quite so well. Infections, commonly, they, infections can absolutely cause it. And it's not just in post-operative patients that you'll see delirium secondary to infections. A lot, of your med a, lot of, a lot of medical wards where you, you, you will see a couple of, you know, kind of little old ladies who've had a bit of a chest infection or a bit of a UTI who are suddenly kind of a bit not quite with it. Um, again, like someone said, opioids could absolutely cause dement could also co absolutely cause delirium. But again, others can too. So benzodiazepines, steroids particularly. So steroid-induced psychosis is also a separate thing. Um, equally, not having enough drugs <laughs> could cause it. So particularly if you are um, if you're used to having a certain level of kind of drugs or or alcohol in your system, and you suddenly take that away because you've had emergency surgery, that could again put you in another um, put you uh, at risk of delirium. And with the case of alcohol, with alcohol withdrawal, withdrawal, it could be kind of put you at risk of, depending on the amount of alcohol you drink, if they're delirium tremens and burning, uh, sorry, delirium tremens rather. Um, dehydration or pain. So again, so too much opioids can cause it, uh, can cause delirium. Too little opioids can also cause delirium. So um, if someone is in a lot of pain, sometimes, um, sometimes delirium is a reaction to that. And again, dehydration, a lot of the time, you know, this, uh, a lot of post-op patients don't, aren't going to be kind of maintaining the oral intake, aren't always going to, aren't going to be, you know, are going to be quite dry. They could have a bit of an AKI. It might be that, you know, they haven't had quite enough fluids. Again, like someone said, constipation, absolutely. And again, opiates could feed back into causing constipation, causing delirium. So it's, it's all a bit of a kind of a, um, it, it is a tricky one. It's absolutely a tricky one. And, and it is kind of, the, the key here is kind of teasing out what's doing it, whether it's the pain or it's a lack of, it's, it's too many painkillers or too little painkillers, whether it's infection or the, the kind of dehydration and absolutely so like someone said um endocrine abnormalities so electrolyte disturbances um there's a really really good page on post-operative um post-operative delirium on uh, this i put the link down here on tissue surgery it's definitely words you need to read so when you when you're suspecting post-operative delirium if someone came in kind of really with it and suddenly they think you know president obama is standing in their room um, you want to do something called a delirium screen. So you want to do urine dip and kind of look for an infection in the urine. You also want to do some fairly specific bloods. So you want FBCs using these LFTs. You also want to look at things like their thyroid function, their hypo or hyperthyroid that could impact on their kind of um, how their um, kind of their cognition. Uh, check on the calcium and the hematinics and do some blood cultures if you're suspecting an infection. And then imaging. So chest x-ray is always helpful if you're worried about an infection in the chest. CT head sometimes, particularly if, um, particularly if you've potentially seen some focal neurology um, or if you've seen kind of knee weakness, you'd consider it. Um, or CT scan might actually just show kind of things like uh, global atrophy or that it might show you kind of a degree of uh, degeneration has existed previously. So I'm just gonna have a look for um, questions. Uh, why calcium? So somebody said why calcium? Um, so yes, so hyper, um, so have you heard of um, stones, bones, groans? Um, so it's hypercalcemia. Um, uh, hypercalcemia can cause you to kind of um, have psych present as kind of not, not quite psychotic, but can um, affect how you, um, how you, it kind of impact on your AMPS essentially. But um, hy hypercalcemia can present with psychiatric symptoms, with kind of uh, psychiatric symptoms. Uh, yes, hypocalcemia can also cause confusion, as someone has said here. 
Uh, does every trust have a default delay and browse screen? No, every trust does not actually. Um, so a lot of a, a lot of trusts will have kind of a delirium screen that you can kind of just put into the system and it will give you the bright plugs, uh, but not everyone. Um, so I worked in two trusts, one had it, one didn't. Um, so management. So you have kind of had three types of delirium. Um, you've got kind of hypoactive, hyperactive, and mixed. So hypoactive are the patients who become kind of really quiet, really sullen, not necessarily sullen, but really quiet, don't kind of engage as much as they would have previously. They stop eating quite so much, stop drinking quite so much. Um, so they become more withdrawn. Hyperactive is kind of the other end of the spectrum, the ones that become agitated and sometimes aggressive and sometimes quite um, quite vocal. Um, and essentially, the, point, the, the thing with delirium is that you, it's treating the cause. There is no kind of easy answer to it. Um, but the other stuff you can do is kind of the classic stuff of it, optimizing the environment, making sure they're in a side room, making sure they've got a clock on the wall, that the same nurse is seeing them, that you're not adding to the confusion. And, and sometimes this is easier said than done. So um, depending on your ward, some wards are busier than others. Some wards are better start than others. So it's easier to do this on some wards and kind of a little bit less so on others. But but try. I mean, that, that's what what you can do is try and make sure you know they've got a you know um, your, their room isn't kind of you know they're they're kept away from kind of the really kind of exciting the really busy areas of the wards, um, and you know they're getting their meals on time and that sort of thing, um, and things like making sure you've got adequate analgesia, making sure they've got fluid intake, um, and monitoring bowels. Sedatives should be used sparingly. So so generally, the geriatricians don't recommend managing it. You you know the, the first line of the first protocol is absolutely not a sedative and they tend to um if, if it is necessary you tend to go for something like haloperidol over um over benzodiazepine so good what is the stepwise treatment approach for prescribing laxative uh like laxative so there's kind of three big ones that you wind up prescribing in um in um, in your job. Um, so you'll have lactulose, which is essentially a, a bulking agent, as it's an osmotic laxative, so it just essentially bulks the stool. You'll have movicol or macrocol or laxido, it's all kind of the same thing. Um, this, this has kind of components of bulking out stool and increasing gut motility. And then you'll have things like senna um, that are essentially irritants to the bowel and cause increased gut motility that way. Um, so they, they all kind of had their pros and cons. So with things like Things like lactulose, it's a tiny little cup of about 15 mils of, um, of, um, of uh, it's a little syrup that's about 15 mils that you drink. Um, and so it can be administered quite easily. But the trouble is it gives lots of patients quite a lot of bloating. Um, it doesn't work particularly fast. And not, not a lot of people, some people don't like it. Um, then there's kind of macrogol, which you wind up dissolving a sachet in kind of a little, about a, a 200 mil cup. So a lot of the time what winds up happening is the nurses dissolve it and they give it to the patient, the patient says, absolutely, I'll drink it, and then forgets about it. So it doesn't always get it doesn't always get taken in the way that you think it's being taken. And senna is um, kind of it's just two pills that you take at night. So it's 50, you tend to prescribe 15 milligrams at night. Um, and this this it can be a little bit more potentially a little bit uncomfortable, but it does work fairly quickly. Um, so everyone kind of winds up having their kind of favored combination. So um, some of our geriatricians tended to go with um, macrogol. Some of our some of our surgeons tended to like um, lactulose and senna. So it really kind of, you, you try, you wind up figuring out what, what you think works best. Um, I tend to think macrogol is quite a sensible idea. But then on our, so I, I did a renal job after that and you wanted to, and we had patients on kind of uh, fluid restrictions. They could only have a litre of water a day. And then if you're going to spend 200 mils of that on a, on a laxative, you're kind of, it feels quite mean. So you really do need to taper it to the situation. There isn't really a stepwise approach per se, um, but you need to think about what's appropriate for your patient at that time. So if they can swallow a pill, consider a pill. Um, you know, if they're not going to do that, then, you know, think about that sort of thing. Um, so, case three, they're in a lot of pain. So, again, so you get, this is another thing that you get called on, uh, you call, get called about a lot on a surgical ward, it's management of pain. Um, and, oh, oh dear, I, ah, oh shoot, I'm so sorry. Um, I think, I think one of my slides has gotten lost. But essentially, you are you asked to assess an eighteen-year-old who's day three post um, um, post um, uh, right hemicolectomy post hemicolectomy for UC, um, and they're saying they're in a lot of pain. 
kind of uh, in the comments, if you could put down what, what your first thoughts are and what you're worried about, that'd be really helpful. That'd be really good. Um, from Facebook, so somebody saying infection, yeah, absolutely. Infection could cause pain. Uh, bowel obstruction, yeah, absolutely. Inadequate in analgesia, yeah, absolutely. Inad that, that's a massive problem. Um, ileus potentially, um, ileus could potentially cause, present as pain. Um, it could, it generally presents a sort of uh, bowel obstruction almost. So they wouldn't open their bowels, there'd be no wind, they wouldn't be passing wind, they might be vomiting. Yeah. So I'm just going to move on to how you'd assess these patients. So, um, so I thought I'd cover AGE over here. So, um, so this patient is kind of a bit tachycardic. He's a bit hypotensive, and he's a bit, he's spiking a little bit. He's he's spiking. So at this point, absolutely. So you want to do an ATE approach. You want to make sure that the airway is patent. You want to make sure that the respirate kind of uh, make sure that they're saturating acceptably. That they actually expand. They have adequate chest expansion. You want to look at the temperature blood pressure. So the ABCDE is kind of a, a very a systematic approach to quickly assessing a patient. Um, so absolutely, things like, so absolutely, um, an infection post-op could, could cause quite a lot of pain. Quite a lot of the time, though, it is, um, it is inadequate analgesia. So what I'm going to go on to do is go on to kind of managing an analgesia. So inadequate pain control can... Um, can result in quite a lot of kind of slow recovery, a reluctance to mobilize, inadequate ventilation, which can again have a knock-on effect onto things like DVTs, things like chest infections, things like your hospital stay, um, things like your mood post-operatively, your willingness to deal with the kind of recovery process. Um, and you have kind of, you have this, um, everyone, I'm sure everyone's got, gone over the WHO analgesia ladder. But a couple of pointers here is regular paracetamol is actually incredibly effective. So make sure before you kind of start going up to opiates and, you know, NSAIDs and all that stuff, make sure they're just getting the regular paracetamol as a baseline. Um, NSAIDs need to be used with care. So um, again, you, you want to make sure that you're not, you're not prescribing them to someone at risk of potentially uh, having an ulcer or an upper GI bleed. Again, opioids can be very effective, but they need to be used with a lot of care. Like we talked about before, they, can, they have all sorts of side effects that can complicate patient recovery of patients, particularly in the older patient. Constipation, nausea, sedation, confusion, respiratory depression. Um, so every once in a while, we'd have someone on a PCA who was, who was having just a little bit too much. So we one not once, not every once in a while, but once or twice, we had someone on a PCA who'd had a little bit too much um, opiate. And then you'd you'd wind up having to administer a tiny bit of naloxone to try and reverse the effect. Um, but um, but yeah, so you you do want to be very careful with how you prescribe opiates. Um, and do and, and when you're prescribing opiates, make sure you're prescribing laxatives along with it. Um, outside of kind of oral routes, there's percutaneous analgesia, and these kind of tend to be managed by the anesthetist. And generally, people will come down on them from theatre. So things like a patient control analgesia, uh, analgesia. This is just a pump going giving IV morph, uh, morphine, oxycodone, or some sort of opiate. Um, these can, so in our trust, we were allowed to prescribe these on the advice of an anesthetist if someone was in a lot of pain postoperatively. And every once in a while, someone would come down um, who, wasn't, who wasn't expected to require it, but we would then be able to set up. And a lot of times, surgical nurses are brilliant. They, they tend to know how to get it set up and get it going. All you need is a cannula lens that you to allow for you to have a PCA running. Um, epidurals tend to go, um, patients come in, to, when you have epidurals, you tend to come down, um, patients tend to come down with, again, a catheter leading into the epidural space. Um, and this is essentially a continuous in administration of um, a local anesthetic into the epidural space. So it tends to be things like bifivacaine. Um, and these, these stick around, these will, these will essentially give you analgesia from kind of a level, a spinal level downwards. The trouble is they'll also come, they'll also cause you to be unable to move your limbs below that level. So it's not so great for getting patients to mobilize, but it is quite a very effective pain relief. Um, and again, this would only be started by an anesthetist. So always help to know you need to, you know, kind of get, get in touch with them if you're worried that it's not working or, you know, the catheter might, or the catheter is dislodged because um, it's always best to flag these things up early. And then spinal. So spinal, sta spinal is another kind of form of algesia. You inject, it, it's a one-off injection into the spinal canal. Um, people then tend not to come down with catheters um, situated um, situated in um, when they have a spinal analgesia. It's just administered in 
spinal anesthetic is just administered in theatres. They tend not to come down with any sort of gizmos attached to them. But do look at protocols. And no protocols for step down, actually, particularly in patients with PCAs. Uh, you want to know what you can step them down to from, from this kind of continuous infusion of whatever strong analgesic is they're on. Um, whether you, whether it would be whether, what the protocol at your hospital is. So we tended to step down to kind of a QDS regime of um, the opioid they were on IV and then kind of taper it down. Um, so, um, so I'm just going to go through, I'm just going to look through questions. Uh, no, more, no, I'm done with Kate. How many more cases after this? No more cases, I'm done. Uh, would you cons would you contact a senior senior prior to prescribing sedatives? Um, this would depend. So um, so in the daytime, absolutely yes, yes is the answer. I would contact a senior, particularly in your first months. It would be more sensible just to double check. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to end off with a couple of tips, just about kind of what helped me get what what I find useful during F1. Uh, one more question on chat, I think. Oh, what is atelectasis? So atelectasis is essentially um, impaired, decreased ventilation, particularly in the lower zones of the lungs. So it's when you're not taking quite as deep breaths. The lungs kind of collapse on each other a little bit. Um, and it's essentially, you'll see classically a little bit of shadowing in the bases. Uh, and what this suggests is that you're not kind of, they're not being adequately ventilated. And atelectasis is essentially that, is that squashing down of those areas in the lung that predispose you to an infection. Oh, so a couple of tips on, oh, sorry, one more question on chat, I think. I had a question from the beginning slide. If you're on a surgical placement, you're mostly on the wards as opposed to theaters. Yes, you're mostly on the wards. Um, yeah, you're pretty much, you're generally on the wards. Um, you tend to get called to theaters. Um, you'd get sent to theaters if, well, some jobs do have some theater time scheduled in, but that tends to be for the F2s. Um, but if they're short staffed um, and you're on the wards and the wards are quiet, they tend to send, you, you might get sent down to theaters. Um, so a couple of tip, couple of things that I found useful during F1, um, kind of, or, I, or a couple of tips for kind of surviving F1, really. Um, be nice to each other. Like, it just makes everyone's lives easier. And I, I know it goes without saying, but um, it's a stressful job. And kind of the, the one thing that makes it less stressful is kind of having friends to kind of do it with. So our first job, so I, I think in my first F1 job, there were like nine of us. And it was a really busy ward and there were really sick patients. But because there were kind of so many of us working together and we worked quite well, it, it made it kind of a pleasure to work, with, work through really. So I would say be the doctor that you want to work with. And kind of the more you, I know this sounds a bit cliche, but the more you kind of make life easier for other people, other people will make life easier for you. So it's little things and you, 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 you'll start noticing it. It's little things like getting a cup of tea in the middle of the night or someone saying, actually, you know, don't worry, I'll take your TTO, I'll, I'll accept your TTO, I know it's past the deadline. Or you know, it's little things or, you know, a nurse is saying, you know what, I'll, I won't mind, I'll do that blood for you if, if you'd like. And it's kind of, but it is a two-way street. You, you know, if you, as long, when, you, as, when you make other people's lives easier, they'll do the same for you. Um, you will make really good friends at work. It's a, it's a really stressful job and you will be bound by that stress. And um, I think make the most of it. Like you will have a really good time and you will make really good friends in F1. Um, also ask all the questions because no one expects F1s to know anything. <laughs> no one thinks you know anything. So ask all the questions. There isn't a stupid question to ask in F1. Um, there appears to be something on the chat. Yep, a uh, couple of, uh, one or two more, sorry, one or two more slides. Um, I think build up a support system, make sure you know you have people. It's gonna be a good job. F1 is a good job, but it's a really difficult job. Is it, well, it's a good job, but it is a difficult job. So, you know, make sure you have a support system. And this can be friends, this can be family, this can be people you went to university with, it can be people you went to work with. So we had, you know, make sure, make, time, make sure you're making time to spend time with these people. It's, it's important, it, it just, it really does bring a bit of balance to your life. Um, so we, we do a thing where, you know, if, if we'd had a bad week, like we'd, we'd all go up and we'd sit down, we'd have dinner or we'd go to the pub and that made a massive difference, I think. Um, think about, so f a really good time about, about actually thinking about what you want to do with kind of moving forward. Because the thing is, when it comes to applying for your core training jobs, you'll apply sort of in November of your F2. So there isn't really, if you don't want to take an F3, there isn't all that much time to get your kind of application in order for your CT application. Unless you're, happy to, unless you're keen on an F3, in which case, absolutely do it. Like F3s are, you know, really good experience. But if you're the kind of person who really wants just to go in straight into training, then actually you have to think about what the requirements for the training you want to do are. 
um, because F1 is a lot is a really good time to do things like audits, do research projects, do teaching, and, and like I said, the more the more you're a little bit keen, people are really lovely about kind of getting involved in things. Um, yeah. Um, and then finally, enjoy finally having a salary because you know all your friends would have started having jobs and lives way before you. So enjoy this. Uh, yeah, and um, sources and resources. Um, these were a couple of good web websites, I thought. Yeah, so any questions? Nope, nothing there. On the Q&A, Okay, so I've got two on the Q&A section. How would you examine the wound on a ward round before presenting that to a senior? Are you looking for a rash infection? Um, so, so generally, if you're on a ward round, you wouldn't be up. You it'd just be really nice. But having said that, um, the big things you're looking for when you're examining a surgical wound are kind of those tumor rubo dolo. So essentially, you're looking for um, redness, swelling, pain, uh, warmth, discharge. Any sign of an infection really. You're also looking to see that it's actually healing up. So if you're, if you're seeing a bit of dehiscence, it might might be worth flagging up. Um, second, and the other the other question I have is I wondered how much responsibility you have as an F1. Is a lot of the prescribing on the guidance of more senior doctors and acting on the ward um, and acting on the jobs from the ward rounds? So yes, a lot of the stuff you do, so um, I think a surgical job is getting is good for getting good at kind of the little jobs, so getting good at you know ordering your scans and you know knowing when knowing how to get your scans ordered efficiently and getting your TTOs done sensibly. Um, you know, so you don't make very many decisions, particularly on uh, in my experience of surgical, you don't tend to make that many decisions. Um, prescribing you you will get you will get more comfortable with it as you go along. So you you know you won't be kind of double checking, you won't be triple checking on you know kind of going back quite as much. Um, Yes, you again. Yeah, senior doctors are always really lovely. Are always really, really lovely about confirming things. With about if you with, they're really happy to double check, double you know, confirm kind of prescriptions with you and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'll stick around for two or three minutes. If anything comes up, um, I'm happy to answer it. If not, um, yeah. Um, I think I've put the, oh, sorry, that's the feedback link, if uh, people could do feedback. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I've got another question that says, I have upper GI and renal rotations. How can I get the most of these? What do you enjoy about these and what are your tips? Uh, yeah, so I had those too. Um, upper GI, they were both, I had really good time on both. Um, so upper GI, so I'm not sure if, if you're doing, uh, so I went doing upper GI at St. Thomas's, which was kind of, which did kind of a lot of cancer surgery. And it was a really busy ward. It was a really busy team, but it was a really lovely team. And so, so with with my with my surgical rotation, because I knew I wanted to do surgery, I got really involved, really stuck in. So I turned up on my days off to go to theatres. I'd like get involved with every audit I could. I, you know, got involved with a little bit of like researchy projects and some teaching on the side. So I, I might have gone a bit crazy with it, but I had a really good time, and the team were really brilliant. And you know, so the, which meant that every once in a while, if there was a bit, if someone needed a hand in theatres, you know, they the, if they knew you could do a bit of suturing or you'd been in their theatres before, they'd be they'd be more happy to have you in there with them. Um with renal. Uh yeah, so renal is a funny one. So it's it's generally kind of renal centers tend to be kind of specialist services. Um so these these tend to be quite sick, quite complicated patients. Having said that, um as if you're the F1 in a renal ward, no one's going to be expecting you to manage a renal patient on your own. But it's a really, really good fun to get good at medicine, to get good at like just just really just just get to the bare bones of kind of your um think about your physiology think about your pharmacology that sort of thing so it's a really good firm to do and and like generally in my, in my experience a nephrologist has been there really lovely about teaching and really like happy to kind of explain things so actually renal firms are uh, so i was quite i was worried about my renal firm but it was actually such a good learning experience um somebody said how often are you left alone or do you always have some so um especially during nights. So the hospital I worked at, um, if you were doing a surgical job, you tended not to be alone in the wards very much. So it, it doesn't mean that you'd always have an SHO or registrar around, around all the time, but there was generally at least another couple of F1s in the wards with your team or the other team. Um, and generally, um, and so they, they, there was always a couple of people around. If you needed help, there were, so there's generally, so you, there is a kind of a pattern of escalation. So you escalate within your team first. So. Um, to your SHO, your registrar, potentially a consultant. 
and if you if you're having trouble and everyone's in theaters and everyone's tied up then you can always just create sideways so teams outside so this usually kind of there might be um, a perioperative team nearby that, that was always where we had a perioperative team so they were geriatricians to help with uh, post-op patients they were really helpful or you know other other surgical teams are often really really helpful med writers are really helpful um, then, so uh, night night shifts. So, where the way it worked for us, at, at least, was that uh, we we do kind of medical studies. So we didn't have specifically surgical nights. We would just cover everything almost. So we'd, there'd be two F ones and a registrar covering all the wards essentially. <coughs> so you just see a mix of kind of medical, surgical, Jerry's patients. Um, I never really. Got, I think I had one night where someone called in sick, and the, the admitting team was short staffed. So I I was on the wards, but there was always someone kind of a bleep away if I needed help. Um, it depends on how, how good the staffing is at your hospital night shifts. Um, somebody's asking, what exactly is an audit? Um, yeah, so, so audits are, yeah, so this, this is quite a UK, I, I, it feels like it's a bit of a UK specific thing, audits. Um, but they are quite helpful for, they're very helpful for your CT applications. Um, so an audit is essentially, you're comparing, um, you're comparing care that you have in your center towards a goal, to a gold standard. <laughs> and, and the classic one is kind of the oxygen prescription audit where, you know, you're comparing what percentage of people who are prescribed oxygen are, 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 who are on oxygen are, have, are actually prescribed oxygen on the drug chart. Or, you know, things like looking at how what percentage of antibiotics actually follow the antimicrobial guidelines. Um, so you essentially what you're doing is collecting data of patient care and you're saying this is this it's this percentage of patient care that adheres to our goals that adheres to these guidelines or does things in the way that we think it should be done. And then you try and put in measures in place to kind of improve improve patient care or improve the service provision. Um, and the important thing with audits is to ensure that you complete the audit cycle because that's what gives you the most points um, in, in a core training application anyway. Um, so you to complete an audit cycle is to do the initial data collection, put in place an in intervention, and then re-audit to check that your intervention has made a difference. Um, generally try and make the most of your audits. So if you've done gone through all the effort of doing all of these steps in an audit, try and get a try and get a poster presentation out of it. There's lots of kind of conferences around the place um, and there are you know, lots of quality improvement conferences, but also lots of kind of medical or surgical conferences will, will absolutely accept audits as opposed to presentations. So, uh, so we did a quite, we did a couple and we got them as, we, we did them as posters in the end. Um, I don't know what that means when she's in the video. Um, so someone says, how do you get involved with audit and research? I've been asking around. Um, so the way I, so ask around, literally ask everybody. Um, and the thing is people know, if you're interested, people people get that, you know, it's something you have to do. And a lot of the time, um, so what I found was a lot of the time people had projects going and the thing that they needed was someone to do data collection or someone to be the kind of the spreadsheet monkey. Um, and if you're willing to do that, that's kind of step one, you, that's you getting involved already. Um, and so, so what I did was, pretty much ask everybody and and a lot of the time someone would say actually yeah I'm doing a thing come do something with me and and kind of that's how a lot of the projects I wanted to I wanted up doing wound up doing happened by me saying yeah I'm quite interested I'm really keen I want to do this can I you know do you have anything going um other things you can do um you can do star search the so star search there, there's sort of these collectives that do that collect um that collect data kind of from from multiple centers um, but I don't, and they generally publish every year, but I don't know how much, um, whether they, how, how much they count for as points towards your application when you come to court training applications. Um, I, I still think the best way to do it is literally to ask people. Or well, someone says, uh, sorry. What are your tips for preparing for a night shift? Uh, Everyone finds a different way of dealing with it, of preparing for a night shift. So you kind of figure, got to figure out what works for you. For me, I, I mean, I tend not to be able to tend not to be able to kind of sleep in the night. Before. So lots of people like have like a line the day before the night shift. I tend not, I tend not to be able to do that. Um, so it, you really do need to figure out kind of. It, it's it's one of those things you will figure out for yourself. Like there's no kind of effort. Like everyone I know kind of does it differently, um, but. Just, just have a go. See, do your first night shift, and you, you, you'll get an idea as you go along. Really, with nights. Um, what specialty are you interested in? Out of interest, surgery. I really like surgery. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I'm just gonna have a look at the Q and A. If there's anything there. Uh, no, there's nothing more in the Q and A. Um, 
Um, so uh, we didn't get to choose. So somebody's asking when choosing F1 jobs, would you recommend doing a specialty you like? So I should know a lot about. Um, we didn't really get to choose F1 jobs that way. Essentially, we, we applied into the program. We got allocated kind of uh, F1, F2 combination job with kind of four months in several specialties. Um, I picked it based on kind of it having a combination of jobs that I thought were interesting. Yes, so uh, yes, I ranked my jobs based on what jobs I thought were interesting and essentially what I thought was interesting. I, I figured, I mean, I'd never worked in any of them before really because I'd always been the medical student, and, you know, being the medical student in a job and um, against working in a job is, is very different. So essentially I ranked it based on what I was interested in. Yeah, if anyone has any, if no one has any other questions, I will turn it, I will end it there then.